Hello and welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today I am here with Tina McKay. Hello, Tina. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. So we'll just go straight into the big question. What is socialism to you? I'm always one of these people who, when uh, people ask a question, uh, quite a direct question, it, it kind of puts you on the spot and you think, God, I actually don't really know what something is to me because you don't often think um you, you know it's not something you sit in the sofa having a cup of tea what's socialism to me so I don't know um I think really it's it's more sometimes people will say it's about you know political and economic theory and they, they want to go on about talking about you know some academic book that they've read but for me it's more about community it's about the kind of life that um that you want to live that you want to see around you in the community the kind of things that that make life better for everybody. Um, I think for me, it's more about where do you see society? Where do you see um, the people that you you live with, the, the the family that you've got, the environment that you live in? You know, is it, are you feeling secure? Are you feeling safe? Are you feeling happy? And and what makes you feel happy? What makes you feel secure? And how do you do that? And I think it's just. It's kind of, I suppose, a roundabout way of saying it's a way of life. <laughs> so that's a that's a really nice one, considering you felt you were put on the spot. So it's a <laughs> it's a way of life. So like, what kind of what what kind of life do you think? What would be the difference, I suppose, between like um, a non-socialist life and a socialist life? Do you think? Well, I think we're living the non-socialist life at the moment, which is society is so individualized. I think, um, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s, um, Thatcher really impacted it. And I suppose like, you know, we're more than, more than likely the same age. So I think, you know, we don't really remember um, what it was like then, but the impact of, of Thatcher leaving um, she may have left office, but the the political ideology that she brought in and the way of life has stuck around. And you just see people at the moment where it's everybody only seems to care about not everybody. That that's a bit of a generalization, but there's a a way of <clears throat> of life that's that people tend to come home at night, shut the door, and as long as I'm okay, as long as my little community's okay, as long as 
I'm in a job as long as I'm earning money I'm going to be okay and I think that individualized way of life has broken down community it's broken down society and we don't consider how what impacts us impacts everybody else um so for me it's the the entire opposite of what we want and the institutions that we have the public services that we have our schools our our hospital everything like that all depends on on the sort of on the politics I mean it it is about politics it's you know it's I think I I tend to to not say you know these things out loud enough people will say I probably say it too much but it, it is political. It's, you know, it is social. It is political. It's all interlinked. Um, so for me, I, I want to see um, more community, more um, more working together, the, our public services being funded by the, the, the state and providing for all and, and everybody to be, everybody should have access to a home. Everybody should have access to an education. Everybody should have access to health. And when we have a society that provides that, we have a happier, healthy, more economically um, stable, a safer, you know, society. And I just think that we don't have that at the moment. And in particularly um, at the moment in the pandemic, we're able to see how little there is within the fabric of society. Uh, We are seeing elements of communities coming out and supporting each other, but our health service is absolutely unable to cope at the moment. Um, why is that? It's because for the last 10 years we've had austerity, but prior to that we've had a neoliberal agenda, which has been about removing the, the state's responsibility to provide universal health care. And we've now gone to a more um, individualized profit run service and, and it can't cope now. It can't cope um, whenever we are facing what we are facing. So for me, it's we are in a society that is exactly opposite to what I want us to be in, you know, and and that is we are in a capitalist society, which is based on the individual, which is based on profit, which is based on the people at the top making more money and people like myself and and other working class people are the people at the bottom who are making the money for the people at the top. And why can't we have a share of of what we are producing? Why why can't everybody everybody be happy, healthy and, and and provided for. I think today I saw something on Twitter earlier on where Elon Musk is now the richest person in the world and he has a wealth of 190 billion and it's it's obscene. It's how, why, why it's not essential. How can someone need or even acquire that wealth and and somebody else is, and not just somebody, but so many other people have nothing. So many people are homeless at the moment. They're, you know, in America, the same in London, you see tents of people, you know, communities of tents where people are living their lives. And then you have one man who has $190 billion. It just doesn't compute. It's it's obscene. It's it's just unacceptable. And and I just don't know why more people aren't angry about that because how can I just I said you know how can someone have 190 billion pounds and you have countries that probably don't even have access to that wealth it's just obscene it's obscene it, it just <laughs> no it's not it's not the not the way society should be and that's what that's what we were taught I can remember being taught you know that uh, if you work hard enough, you'll get a good job and you'll get money and you'll be um, successful. So success was always uh, measured on what you were going to earn, the, the job that you would get. And I can remember, um, you know, I, I remember thinking to myself going up, oh, yeah, I want to get a really good job and I want to have a really big house. And then you get older. And aside from the fact that, you know, it's an obscene sort of way of, of, of wanting to live, you kind of think um, on a more practical level, no, I don't want that. But It's just more, you know, I've always been told if you work, you know, like I say, if you work hard enough, you know, you will achieve, but effort doesn't equal outcome. We know that, you know, you can work really, really hard and never get to 
um, get a really good job or, or earn a lot of money, does that mean that you're not working as hard as, you know, I would even say Elon Musk works hard because he's not working. It's the people beneath him that are working. But would you say that, you know, he's been a success? Would you say that society has enabled him to, um, to, to make all that money? Yes, society has enabled it, but it, it, it wasn't his effort that enabled it. And I think everything is just upside down. Um, yeah, I, I'm yeah struggling with that, that really, but that kind of, it almost infuriated me, but at the same time was, was just, it's just ridiculous, ridiculous. Elon Musk to me is almost like he does the thick the sort of things that like um a small time supervillain might do you know it's like I'll put a car in space or you know uh, <laughs> that kind of weird it's, thing and yeah but it's someone who is so disconnected from what's going on in not only in his country but around the world where you know we are seeing abject poverty um you know that you, you you hear this all the time, this mantra here, oh, we're the sixth or fifth richest nation and, and all this, you know. And, and then you look around and you see so many people that have nothing and you think, how, how can that be? And and he's busy going, on, oh, yeah, I'm going to stick a car in space. But yet, you know, there's so many people that, you know, imagine what you could do with 190 billion, how you could, you know, make things better. But it shouldn't even be about one individual using their wealth to make it better. The system itself should be designed to that nobody can make that kind of money, but at the other end that nobody should have nothing. It's it's just obscene, yeah. And and yeah, just completely detached from reality. But you know, that's the the one percent for you. And and even worse, they don't care. That's what's even worse about it. And that's what that's what capitalism, that's what the the ideology of you know the the profit over people um, creates is that they believe they are entitled to that. And it's, it's your fault if you haven't got that somehow, you know, it's, you know, you're to blame if you haven't achieved, you're to blame if you haven't got a good job. If you're homeless, it's your fault. What was your problem? Rather than people looking at it and thinking, how did society fail you? How did you not get to be, you know, or how did you end up being homeless? What was um, the what was the economics behind that? Was there, you know, what was the mental health maybe problems behind that? What, you know, there is something that you know that people don't just get up in the, on a Monday morning and decide, oh, I'm going to be homeless today, or I'm going to be a drug addict today, or you know, I'm going to drink loads today. There's something within society that is broken that you end up going down that road and it's not about um punishing people for you know slipping through the net and ending up in that position what we should be doing as society is thinking how can we fix the issues that have created that problem rather than the person being the problem what was it that that drove you down that road um but we don't we we are moving further down the line to um to individualizing problems rather than looking at them from the societal view. So, for example, um, education is the same as, you know, I would say with, within the armed forces community at the moment, I, I worked for an armed forces charity. Um, well, it wasn't, it was to do with uh, veterans leaving the army, you know, and well, obviously if, you, if you're a veteran, you've already left the army, but it was about transition from the services. And, what the the language you would start to hear a lot of would be about resilience um are you resilient enough so you know you've maybe gone away to war and come back and you know you've um whether it's ptsd or, or another mental health um problem that you've ended up with it's oh well you just weren't resilient enough rather than it looking at the issue that, that created the problem and i think it's the same in schools as well they do like re, they're starting to bring in resilience training and you know, it's the same with mental health. It's about, well, you know, did, are you exercising enough? Are you eating enough? Well, if not, you know, it's your problem rather than, it, you know, looking at the pressures of society and thinking, you know, that's why you've ended up with that issue. It, it, but they don't, it's about removing the responsibility of the state and placing it on the individual regardless, you know, and, and it's everywhere and it's just... I, everywhere you look you, you feel it and and it's it's really 
I find it really easy to then start thinking about yourself as and looking at the the situation you're in yourself and you start to think why have I got myself into this position and it's really easy to go down that road then of individualizing um I'm not saying that you're not responsible for for your own life and things that happen of course there is an element of individual responsibility but at the same time the society that we live in at the moment wants to just place everything on the individual and it's it's really scary really really scary and it, if we don't move out of this it you kind of you can go down the rabbit hole of, of wondering where we are going to end up as a society but right now you know I don't really fancy doing that too much I want to find the solutions and I want to be able to move forward with those solutions and and create the society that we need rather than sort of always focusing on the negative of well this is the society we've got but I definitely think the the capitalist sort of uh, profit over people agenda that we've been living under the neoliberal agenda that we've had for so long has broken and I don't know how much further it can go um, they're desperate to rebuild they're desperate to with the pandemic that we've got to to try and you know patch it all back together and, and piece the sort of sea of capitalism so to speak but you can't fix the problems with the same agenda that created them you know and unless people accept that we're just going to constantly go round in these circles and um yeah I think you know we've, we've got to move forward we've got to offer we've got to find the alternatives and make them work so what you've said there there were so many different routes I could have gone down because there's like there's so many different things that are all interconnected and it was uh it was brilliant to hear them all and and for me I always learn so much from speaking to people it's absolutely fantastic um one of the things I was thinking about there while while you're speaking is really your definition of socialism is collectivism versus individualism and I think um I think a lot of people's understanding you spoke about capitalism and neoliberalism and i think people really struggle to know what the difference is now if you go down the adam smith route for example the idea of capitalism was that always has to be invested if you make money as a boss then you hire more people and then that business grows and that was the idea of capitalism but that's not the same for neoliberalism and neoliberalism now we're finding increasingly needs the public sector to bail it out don't we so yeah. um would you would you agree that that would be your definition and would you agree with with what I've just said there yeah definitely um <clears throat> because there's a there's a subtle difference between the two the, the the outcome is the same but it's how you get to it's the process that that's different um neoliberalism for me is actually the more um whether whether you use the word dangerous or damaging or <clears throat> maybe sinister would be the word because it cloaks itself as being the successful um, sort of the, the private sector, so to speak. Um, and, and, you know, they, they are successful because they are the, the private sector. And then, as you say, uh, there's a blip in the road. And who then comes in to fix or, or, or support that private sector? Well, it's the state. Um, you see it with the, the train, the, the railways. You see it with um, education, you see it with hospitals, you see it all the time. And then everybody, and, and then people deride the state and they'll say, in particular, if you look at it, you know, if we talk about it in the terms of the railways, oh, I remember in the 70s, whenever it was state run and trains were really bad and they were overrun and, and you know, they'll go on like this and you think, well, have you been on a train lately? Have you actually commuted anywhere? You know, it is no better, but in fact, it's, costing an awful lot more Why, where does that money go it's not invested in in the <clears throat> in anything like really is, is it's not invested in the trains it's not invested in the tracks signal failures anytime you're on trains delays because of signal failure think, where is this money going so they feel the state comes in bails it out and then depending on who the government are they sell it back to or they they reprivatize it so to speak at such a at such a low cost, but at a huge cost to the public, at a huge cost to the taxpayer, and it happens time and time and time again. And 
at what stage are we going to realize, hang on a minute, why can't we, why can't the state manage these things? Why do we have to sell it off? And, and that's, you know, in, in terms of, of, of what uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, when he was leader of the Labour Party, was offering to the public. We don't need to privatize these things. Why is it that other states can, you know, have an investment in our public services that we don't have? You know, and it's for me, it was it was it's very basic. You know, I think um, we have to look at who is running, who is making the money, who is profiting from our our cost, our taxes, our just our state our, of us as individuals. And then and, and why aren't we saying, no, hang on a minute, enough's enough. This isn't this isn't working, but we don't. And it just seems to be happening constantly and yeah, very very, very frustrating. And I think when you're politically awakened, you, you it seems it to be that everything like that is so obvious that, that you kind of become a bit surprised all the time at how many people don't see it. I, I often will speak to family or, you know, I'll speak to friends who aren't, you know, politically engaged. And it just, they don't see that um, repetition of this process happening um, because Whereas it's spoken about, it's not in the mainstream. You very rarely will hear it. You might hear a little one day and uh, something about uh, network reel, but then the next day it's completely gone. So it's not it's not on the public agenda. And you have to ask, why is that? Well, because they don't want people to know about it. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, sorry. I go off on one all the time. <laughs> 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 no, it was it was really interesting. The point you make about the trains is 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 a really poignant one because we've got um like the the train that runs nearest to me, the East Coast Main Line, used to be run by Stagecoach. They said it was impossible to make a profit, and I think people don't realise how much public money goes into the railways. So they get a, like a load of money to maintain it and and so on. So then it was taken over by East Coast, which uh, became the best value for money train a company uh, under nationalization in the whole country at which point it was sold off and it became i think it became virgin who realized it yeah. wasn't profitable but it was like it was the best value for money you could possibly have and yet no one knows about this and it's back in uh, LN lner now london yeah. northeast railway i think yeah. now again it's back in uh, nationalized again and it works way 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 better mm. and it's it's a bizarre and that was the the Tories who nationalized that so it's not just a it's not just a left-wing thing it actually functions better that way um so with regards to like being a socialist and things what, do you do you think like you've always thought of yourself as a socialist or is there anything about like your upbringing your early life that made you think I'm a I'm a socialist or did did you learn about socialism a bit later I think you know, it's not something I, I ever really thought about. Um, I think growing up um, in Northern Ireland, um, politics is is very much different to the rest of the UK. Um, and it's not so much, I think, um, the household I grew up in, I, I, I was brought up by my granny um, and, you know, very, very big family, um, wider family, you know, um, Im immediate family. It's just myself and my brother, but we have a, a very large family. Um, and it wasn't really a political household. Um, so, I mean, I think my granny, I don't think politics was ever something you know, that we spoke about. Um, and I think really, you know, being from a working class community, you understand politics and, um, you know, the you know, economics of things in a very different way to people that, you know, that aren't working class. So I think... Um, when you, I think a, it was never really something that we, we had in school either. Um, I think for me, um, it's more about life experiences. Um, and I think you realize about the injustice of things. And I think I, st I at a young age, got really, um, got really fired up by injustice. And I think, like, why does this have to be this way? Why is this happening? And, and it, it ha started to happen a lot more. Um, and I think then I, you know, I suppose that, you know, you become more aware of things. I started to read that, you know, a lot more. Um, 
but still at that stage, I probably wouldn't have considered, you know, that I was socialist. I just thought that things would be better if they weren't the way they were. Um, I think, yeah, um, I moved over to England um, in the early 2000s. And it was then really um, that I suppose the definition of socialism really came more to the fore that I thought maybe this, you know, this is, you know, kind of who I am. Um, I remember the um, anti-Iraq war marches and it was, I, I remember, you know, looking at Jeremy Corbyn's speech, I remember here, you know, hearing that speech back and it, you know, it makes you look, to, look into someone then, doesn't it? You think when somebody makes an impact, you think, hang on a minute, I'm going to go and have a look at this. And, you you know, socialism was was really sort of talked about. And I think, you know, I'd read historical things about the Labour Party and um, about class politics um, aside from the UK. And I thought, yeah, I, I identify with that. But it wasn't really, I don't think I really still um, thought in those terms. I was just kind of, I was dealing with life. I was dealing with the things that, you know, were coming my way. I was dealing with, uh, as you do. And it wasn't really, um, I suppose, because for me, politicians, politics didn't really speak to me the, in the mainstream. You know, it, I was one of those people who was very much, um, they're all the same. Nothing can change, you know, through mainstream politics. So I suppose it wasn't really, I think it was really around about the time of austerity coming in that I suppose are really then thought in terms of capitalism and socialism and what am I I've never been one of those people who thinks oh well I'm one of these I'm one of those you know I think when you grow up in Northern Ireland and you're defined by a label you don't really want to think about labels um throughout your life you know you or not maybe not everybody does but for me it was a case of I didn't want to be defined by a label but when things become so difficult as they have been I think you have to pick a side um, and and that's really where I thought this is what I am. Um, but before before austerity, I I was like I say, you know, social justice in, and injustices were um, were things that I was switched on to, and and they motivated me and and got me angry. But um, it wasn't really until I became more politically involved in the mainstream that I actually thought no. I the label socialism was something I think, yeah, that's something I that I am and I know that I am. Um, but yeah, I suppose I let I was a socialist, but just didn't really know that I was because I wasn't, you know, defining, you know, myself by a by a label or or you know, a, in some way a, a political thought. You talked there about like kind of thinking people were all the same. And I suppose I can really relate to that because I was involved in the in the noughties. I was very much involved in the trade union movement. And I never really thought you know, I, I need to be involved with that political side of it because all politicians at that time sort of reminded me of middle managers. Yeah or senior leaders being a teacher. <laughs> and it'd be the people who tell me to do something that I, I was looking at, I was thinking is this, this is a bit pointless. This is not, this is not something that's necessary to be done. You're telling me to do this, to, to tick a box or to, to make, make yourself look good. And I often felt like politicians spoke the language of middle management. Yeah. Um, so like I, and before we were on, before we started the recording of this interview, we started talking about like kind of getting involved in politics. So yeah. how did you get involved in politics and about what time did you get involved in that? I think um, uh, formally involved in politics um, was um, <clears throat> around, well, it was mid, well, 2015. Um, I, like yourself, um, it was when a politician spoke, you kind of just shut your ears because they just didn't connect. It, you know, I felt they weren't speaking, you know, for me. They were speaking at me or over me or... You know, I, so I wasn't, you know, and it was a case of all the same. I think, you know, even when Labour were were in power, it was like that was supposedly the party that, you know, was I'm working class. I, you know, you, you grow up knowing that, you know, the Labour Party or the party of the working class. And I remember, you know, thinking like this, this, this isn't, I don't, re you don't resonate with me. Nothing you're saying is, is really sort of, um, I have just been so disengaged. Um, 
And I remember, I, I say I was disengaged, but I was, I was one of those armchair politicians, as many people are, you know. Um, BBC Question Time hadn't quite, you know, put me over the edge at that stage. So I was still watching it and, you know, and I was getting quite frustrated and animated. And, you know, that was, you know, where my level was at because I kind of thought to myself, well, I'm not going to be able to change anything, you know, how, because politics is so far from me. And I think um, you feel so disengaged, you feel powerless. So I kind of didn't really feel that there was any, anything that I could bring to the table. Um, it was an, ex it was kind of like exclusive, you know, it, the talk about being representatives of the people, but then there's no way for you to kind of, you know, felt like there was no way really, you know, to be involved. So how could I be involved in this process? Well, I can't be, so there's nothing I can change. I'm powerless. I'm not going to be involved. But yet, as I say, you still get frustrated. You're still, you know, angry about the situations. You're still being engaged. So I'd watch question time. I'd be, you know, watching elections. And, and I loved watching the you know the the possibility of change you know it's any election night it's it's a case of what's going to happen is there going to be a significant change are we going to see you know things you know a real difference being made or the possibility it was always about the possibility of something um and i remember um the 2015 general election and i think it, it was significant because there was the projections that labor were going to win and i think because the the coalition had been so damaging and you know austerity had been so the, well, the start of austerity had been really really bad and I thought there's going to be a massive change here and on a personal level um for me it was there needed to be a change um my mum uh, does be very very unwell she's got a serious mental illness and I've seen the destruction of mental health services over the years, um, and that hasn't just been by one political party. It's it's been both parties, and and we get back to that neoliberal agenda and how and the destruction of the NHS. And so for me, I was panicking um, during austerity because of you know you know that whenever you have close family or friends that are relying on the state um, that you know, whoever is in government and, and the political agenda, you know, makes a huge difference to their lives and, and then in turn to your own. So I thought, you know, this is this is going to be a moment of hope. So as per usual, sat up all night watching things unfold. And God, I remember it like I think it was about four in the morning when Ed Balls lost his seat. And I may be very diff different political persuasion to Ed Balls, but uh, you knew that something big was happening when that happened. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, is this going to be that this is surely not going to be, you know, anything good? And I think, you know, it was probably about half six in the morning when they declared that, you know, it was a Tory majority. And I just, honest to God, it felt like, you know, I'd been winded. It, it just, I remember like, it was like everything had been ripped out of your soul. I thought, oh, Jesus Christ, what is going to happen now? And I panic, I really did panic. I thought, oh my God, you know, it was really bad under. The coalition um what the hell is it going to be like under the tories with a majority and i thought shit you know what am i going to do um and i kind of thought well what can i do and i thought well you know there's there's only one thing to do you've kind of got to be part of some sort of fight back you know for the for our communities for the working class you know what and what can i do well i'll join the labor party <laughs> so i was like yep so 10 o'clock, I remember 10 o'clock the morning after, no sleep, phoned up, joined the Labour Party and um, was kind of, you know, thought ah, you, you can either be, you can either be that person who sits continuing watching through the television and getting really annoyed, or you can try and be involved and try and, and, and fight back. So yeah, joined the Labour Party and thought, let's get, let's get cracking. Um, and then Obviously, then I think it was a few months later, it was September, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn then became the Labour Party leader. And I just I remember um, I, I lived in Catrick at the time and there was a I'd been involved in the, the phone in for for Jeremy to, to become leader. But there was a, a rally going to be in Newcastle. And I thought I am there was an opportunity to be a steward. And I thought. I have to get to that. I, I need to go and, and, and see this for myself. So I drove up to Newcastle 
in what was possibly one of the worst nights to drive on the A19. Don't know how I survived anyway. Aquaplane and all sorts of thought, Jeremy Corbyn's going to kill me. You know, quite literally, I'm going to die <laughs> driving to, you know, to hear a political speaker. I was like, how sad would that be? You know, that on my obituary, you know, how did she die? Well, she was driving to a political meeting. Oh, yeah. You know. But I remember getting there and it was just, you know, hearing um, just someone speak in, you know, lay speak basically it wasn't the managerial type, but, you know, all the other um, the people at the leadership, you know, the, in, in those hostings all sounded the same. They were like one homogenous kind of voice of, you know, what do we think people need to hear? And then Jeremy just spoke about how things were and how we could change them and how we as people you know could could be part of that we had the power and I thought that's it you know that you know this is this is you know really significant and I felt for the first time that politics actually was um reaching outwards and and bringing people in and and it was being representational it was giving us a voice and and we could actually be part of something so I think um I then we we moved to Colchester in 2016 and I remember thinking to myself you know you kind of research don't you when you're going to move it's like oh what's the CLP like oh it's quadrupled in size this is going to be amazing you know and uh, I think at that stage I still hadn't even in any way thought that I was going to do anything sort of significant I was just wanted to be part of building things within a community I wanted to um, empower communities. I wanted people, I wanted communities to empower themselves. It, it's just the notion that we could actually build and and, and make um, our communities better, make the the li our lives better, uh, make just everything, the, 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 the hope that was there, the hope of, of change, of, of rebuilding, it was so significant. It really suck, seeped into every sort of part of your 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 sort of thinking and at that stage still wasn't thinking I was going to do anything um and then the 2017 election came and I remember uh I, I actually put a bet on the 2017 election and, and bet, put a bet on for a hung parliament so you know all, all our efforts actually financially gave me a bit of a win there as well and I actually got laughed at when I went into the bookies to place the bet the uh guy behind the counter laughed at me and I remember saying to him I was like you'll be laughing on the other side of your cheek when I come in for my money thinking god it better <laughs> and uh yeah collected my money from the same place as well it deliberately went back and it was <laughs> it was a good feeling but you know not as good enough I would have rather we I'd have lost the bet and we won but you know at that stage you know it the there was still still hadn't hadn't really thought about anything um and then uh Colchester then was uh, declared to be one of the target seats um, after the 2017 general election. And I remember that uh, they, they selected it as an all women shortlist. I still hadn't really thought about it. Um, and then I knew coming up to the deadline for the application that, um, that the people standing there was no um left wing no socialist person um from our clp that was standing for the position i thought no way i was like you know somebody has got to fly the flag for socialism somebody has got to stand who believes in you know the agenda who believes in socialism who believes in what jeremy is talking about who you know somebody's got to do that whether you win or not somebody's at least got to stand and represent and I remember the morning of the, and I, I hadn't thought at any stage that I, that I was going to, you know, succeed in in kind of being the candidate. It was just, it, it wasn't something I'd thought about. And I remember the morning of the hustings, um, and I said to my husband on the way out the door, I was like, we'd had two weeks of campaigning, you know, before the hustings. So I remember saying to my husband on the way out the door, I was like, don't worry. I was like, after today, life is going to go back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> worst words that ever came out of <laughs> ever came out of my mouth because yeah life hasn't been normal uh <laughs> since then and yeah I, I uh, got selected the the membership uh, voted me to to be the parliamentary candidate and so I uh, that was how I became inducted into uh British politics in a very formal way um but I uh I I think 
you know, the beauty of the Labour Party, um, and there's a lot that's that's lovely about it, but there's an awful lot that isn't, is that whoever you are, wherever you come from, you can have an opportunity to be a representative of your community. And it doesn't matter if you've never stood in a formal role. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, it, there is no um, discrimination about that. And I think that it's just absolutely fantastic that regardless of, of who you are, that you can stand to represent you know your community and it's yeah it was it's been a very interesting um short-lived few years um of my political career but uh it's it's certainly something that you know it, it's gonna be something that I'm sure I'll look back on in in time and think wow you know I I did that and that pol that politics can be accessible when you think it can't be um it was was a surprise, um, but it's certainly certainly been an interesting uh, way into politics <laughs> and a way out as well. <laughs> so I remember all those times you were talking about from 2015 onwards. I'd actually uh, I was a member of the Labour Party um, and from 2014 I joined because I was just thinking, oh, God, this is desperate. You know, I, you know, I saw the I, actually I joined after the uh, controls on immigration mugs. I was like. We can't be having this. We can't be borrowing, you know, the far right rhetoric. We can't be doing that. And I've been involved in trade union campaigns against the BNP and, and what have you. And I could see the same language seeping across. And I'm a bit kind of concerned sometimes now as well, because yeah. I don't think we ever gain votes from borrowing from the far right. But um, I remember the enthusiasm of 2015 and that mm. infectious in enthusiasm and then the awful attacks for a couple of years. And then the enthusiasm when they were kind of like, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, isn't all these evil things they're saying about him? <laughs> and then they were like, oh, no, he nearly won. And then they like had two years of, no, he really, really is those evil things that we made up about him. He really yeah. is. Like that really happened. And then, you know, that, that really took hold. And I think it's really strange now the way people say, look, Jeremy Corbyn was a problem on the doors in 2019. You think, but they don't take any responsibility for the part they played in him becoming yeah. a problem on the doors. Like, yeah, I accept it. a lot of people didn't like him in the end. But, you know, if you keep on saying someone's horrible, yeah, eventually yeah. someone's going to stick. But like, how did it feel like kind of standing in, in 2019 for a parliamentary seat after having such like this upbeat, this really, really powerful, hopeful movement. And in the end, I thought in the end, it, it just felt almost attritional. Like it was a backs to the wall, rear guard, everyone like acting as if we, we were this awful bad guy kind of Brexit stopping machine where, mm. how did it feel yeah. like, you know, 2019? Oh, I mean, I, I love, I loved it. I mean, I think you can kind of gather that, you know, I, I do like a bit of a conversation. So I, I I do love talking about politics, but not just about politics, because I think that sort of limits it. I love talking to, to people um, and, and hearing from them, you know, listening to what their experiences are and, and how they want to change things and how they want their communities to change. And for me, the, I believe I believed and I still do believe in what we were offering. Um, and I knew 100% with my heart that, it, you know, that was going to make a significant difference for the better for people's lives and our communities. And for me, that that was no problem. So I loved the challenge when someone said, you know, something negative, because if you really believe in what you're offering, it doesn't matter what that negativity is that, you know, you can deal with it. And I think it, for me, I mean, we our, the campaign was so vibrant. We had so many people um, involved and, and hyped up and really involved in it that, you know, it was really enjoyable. But, you know, in the back of your mind, I mean, I, I knew that we weren't going to win the seat, but, you know, you don't mobilize um, volunteers by saying, look, we're not going to win, but we're still going to go out the doors here. You know, the, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, you, 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 for me, it was about a case of when we lose, because we weren't going to win. Brexit was the, the significant thing. Um, but 
you know, when you lose, what you want is for people to have felt that they absolutely know in their heart that they did everything that they could to win. And that's much better than kind of half-heartedly doing something and then being left with the thought of, damn it, maybe if we tried, you know, so you, you want to know it's, it's better to have tried and failed than never to have tried at all. So we gave it our all. We absolutely gave it everything. And I loved every minute of it, even the really challenging times. But it was heartbreaking at times um, to hear, especially from communities that you knew that our message really, you know, um, should have been resonating with. Um, and they knew, you knew that they knew that what we were offering was really, really good. But you would often get, look, it doesn't matter about the NHS. We just want Brexit done. Or, you know, if someone said something, you know, about Jeremy, you know, for me, it was a case of having met Jeremy and, and knowing that the person that he is was so heartbreaking for you. You'd almost be able to tell what newspaper somebody had read or, you know, what um, news they were watching on TV when they regurgitated something back. And you thought, you, you don't actually dislike Jeremy. You dislike the personification of Jeremy. You dislike the, the way they've characterized this man, you know, but it's not actually him that, you know, I, I used to think that if you got everybody together who really thought they disliked Jeremy and they met him, they'd go away thinking of a, you know, about him completely differently. And for me, it was, you know, it was hard because, as I say, I knew that for us to be able to win the seat, well, you know, would have been an absolute miracle. But for me, it wasn't about winning. It was about what could I build? What, what could I um, leave behind for, you know, um, whatever was going to happen next, um, whoever, you know, is the next candidate, that they're not starting from a base level that, you, you know, you kind of build something that so over time, the chances of winning get, you know, more and more and more, you know, likely. Um, but it does, it's not just about um, sort of, you know, the, the state of, of, of how you've left things. It's the, the political message does have a huge impact on, on, on your chances. So if we didn't have Brexit, the chances of us winning were probably really significant. You know, I would say, I would, you know, say without Brexit, the, we really would have given, you know, the Conservatives, you know, a, a much uh, better run for their money. But something as significant as Brexit that had such huge support, it, it also had a lot of uh, people that didn't support it, but it was a very, a lot of the support for Brexit was for a hard Brexit. So it didn't matter what we were really talking about. And that was the heartbreaking thing that, you know, it was just always this one thing. And it just, yeah, I think for me, that was the thing. When you when you feel and, and, and believe that you've got the answers to the uh, problems that your community faces, but they're ignoring that for something that's actually going to cause potentially, you know, more harm to your community that that's when you go home at night and you think how can I change this how can I get through that barrier and yeah just accepting that you've just got to keep trying to push but know that the outcome isn't maybe going to be the outcome that you want so yeah I'm often reminded of um I went to TUC Congress in in 2011 I was uh, I was I was talking young I wasn't actually young my trade union defined me as young then for some reason I was like 29 but that is young but, shush <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but in the, on the scale of uh, being con considered a young member, but anyway, uh, so I went there then, and uh, we got into a little bit of a, a battle with what was then the uh, the NUT, because they put this thing saying, um, "Can we can we reform Ofsted?" And our argument was, "You don't want the Tories reforming Ofsted, you know, you you don't want." to give them carte blanche to do something terrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're seeing now with Brexit. Like I wasn't, I wasn't particularly, I was like, okay, yeah, I, I would have preferred to remain, but actually Brexit can be fine. You could make it successful, yeah. but I just don't want them to do it mm -hmm. because they're going to do this damage yeah. and you can see what they're doing with that. You can see that they're, they're, they're making it for big business that, like, you know, that it's going to be easier to do dodge tax and yeah. all these things and you just think oh no you know could could we have not just had a go yeah. at that could we, I think we could have done a lot better job and done something for people yeah definitely I mean I I don't know if you you know today there was it's the uh the first um of what we've expected where 
a Conservative MP has said that you know, now that we're out of the EU, we should get rid of the working time directive. And, and, and you just know that it's it's not necessarily about, you know, the, the big businesses dodging tax. It's about how many hours are you going to be working? You know, what's your, you know, what's your pay packet going to be? You know, and it's these are the things what are there? It's just going to be a complete bonfire of, of, of rights, you know, and of, of workers' rights, but not even workers' rights. It's going to be a bonfire of absolutely everything. And yeah, I mean, that that was that was my message on the door as well. Was that, you know, Brexit's happening, but you know, at least we will make it better for the people. But because of the the damage that that the change in policy did from 2017 to 2019. And, and I hold Keir Starmer significantly responsible for that because he was the person who, who was driving behind that. And, and we now, you know, are left wondering whether was it ever really about Brexit at all, you know, and, and was the agenda, you know, clearly about something else which they have achieved. And, you know, to significantly change that, um, we became untrusted um so even when i said to people on the door look you know brexit will be better under us it was a case of no we don't believe that you're going to do it and um it was it was heartbreaking because you know i think even just looking at, at this week alone three times we have seen in one week where our message what what we were saying has been proved right you know and jeremy with with the broadband you know donald trump with you know housing all these things and and, and you think um how many more I actually actually said this to my husband today I went how many more times are we going to see Jeremy Corbyn proven right um and it's not something I don't say that as a gloat I don't say that as a you know where we're right and you were wrong it's more coming from a place of frustration because for him to be proven right we're not in a good place because you know you know it, if it if there wasn't something wrong, we wouldn't be sitting going, yeah, but we had the answers. And it, like I say, it's not about gloating. It's just about, it's that frustration of knowing things could just be so much better. I absolutely agree with you there. Um, so we're going to move on to the very last bit and we're going to make quite short because I've really enjoyed this conversation and I've been so interested in the different things that we've kind of slightly overrun, but that's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. That's always a good sign. Um, so, I was just going to ask, what sort of vision for the future do you have? How do we build this like kind of socialist society? Um, you know, would it, would it be a better society if we had socialism? And how do we get there? Uh, without a doubt, it is. It would be a better society. Um, you know, for me, I, I look at, at things like um, public services. So one of the greatest, uh, so, sorry to, you know, go back though, um, when, people, when you mention about socialism, people who don't necessarily um, understand or, you know, the, the, they've heard it being used as a, as a sort of slanderous word, panic whenever we talk about socialism. And, you know, I'll often talk about the NHS, people saying, oh, but socialism never works. And you think, well, hang on a minute, look at your schools, look at, you know, um, your health service. And, you know, for, for me, life would be so much better because our public services would be better. Our standard of living would be so much better and we would all be better. Socialism isn't about one person doing better. Socialism is about bringing everybody else forward, about helping everybody. As Jeremy used to say, it's so true and, it, you know, it really is that nobody would be left behind because socialism doesn't leave anybody behind. Socialism, you know, brings us all forward. Um, and I think, how do we get there? Well, I think, you know, there's... It's not necessarily, and I think that, you know, this has been the problem that we've had over the last few years is that we've looked top down from, for socialism. We've looked, you know, to Jeremy, we've looked for a leader to lead us, you know, on this, like, you know, down the, the yellow brick road and we'll find socialism at the end of it. But, you know, what we found there was that, you know, we had the cherry on the cake before the cake was baked and we will only get to socialism if we organize ourselves in our communities, in you know our societies, doesn't necessarily have to be in the Labour Party. Organising and community work was on outside the Labour Party. Um, and what we have to do is, I think a, a big part of it though, is, is about political education. And there used to be so much of that. Trade unions used to be, you know, much more vibrant, used to be, you know, much um, more engaged. And, and, you know, the majority of working class people, you know, were in trade union. And, 
So we've lost that connection between um, what it, what drives working class politics. Um, so I think what we need to do is have a balance of we need to have that political education, but we also we need to be organizing ourselves. We have the power. And, uh, you know, to go back to I know, you know, I'm going back again to, to Jeremy, but we are the many. We do have the power to change things. But, you know, and that's why divide and rule works so well, because they know we have the power. They know that, you know, if we only realize what we can have, that, we you know, we can get it. And I think we need to look to other um, other countries where, you know, the organizing has created the 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 drive and the structure and the confidence within the communities. So, you know, if you look at Bolivia, um, where you see what what happened when they removed their socialist leader, socialism didn't just die. They, the, the communities, because they were so organized through their trade unions and through community organizing, that's where you find that it, it didn't matter that they removed the leader because they had built the structure to be able to maintain itself whenever the leader goes. When you look at what's happened here, the leader is gone and we've all just kind of been left in disarray. So what we need to do is learn from that. We've got to organize ourselves. We've, and community organizing was something that um, I really I championed as well whenever I was uh, a parliamentary candidate. I believe that Jeremy had that right idea. What we need to do is, is not necessarily do it through that uh, bureaucratic Labour Party uh, system. We need to do that ourselves and we have to engage people you know wherever wherever you are whatever space you're in whoever you're with talk about politics talk about how we can change things bring people with us and the strength in numbers the more people you talk about the more people you engage the more people you organize the, the bigger your chances are of, of changing things so I think for me when when the election ended it was you know I, I, I won't deny I was you know in a very dark place where you think there is no hope and you think everything's gone um the hope of those years is gone or uh, you know you just want to give up but you can't socialists don't give up we fight on we because we know that at the end of that battle it may be you know and you may fight many 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 battles but at the end of that is a better way and I think we just have to keep bringing people with us and you know not um not thinking that 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 the next battle is going to be success because you're always going to be having those battles. It's just that we have to not, not consider each defeat as being that final defeat. And I suppose it's, it's, you know, one of the great uh, socialists that, you know, that we all sort of look to is, is Tony Benn. And, and, and what he does say is there is no final victory and there is no final defeat. You, you do have to keep, you know, fighting. It's, it, it is going to be a battle, but You've just got to believe that at the end of it, we are going to achieve this the society that we're striving to achieve. So don't give up, keep the hope and just keep organizing and, and we will get there. With people like you on our side, we will. Thank you so much, <laughs> Tina. <laughs> You've been absolutely incredible. I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, so thanks from Socialist Think Tank and uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again. Oh, well, thanks for having me on, Paul. Cheers. The red flag flying here